Hello and welcome to the Celtic View podcast, the podcast of the nine in a row champions. And as an extra bonus for you, not only are some of you being able to listen to our uh, wise words, but you're also able to watch us on the screen. Uh, for those of you watching, uh, uh, you'll see that I'm Paul Cuddy. I'm the editor of the Celtic View. I'm joined by my two Celtic View colleagues, Joe Donnelly and Tony Conley. And guys, it's good to see that we're all on brand with the Adidas gear. Of course, today, August the 6th, is the day where the, the new kit is launched, the, the new Superstore reopening, and uh, we're all looking, I think, very impressive. Hi, nice to get used to the, the new uniform. I think it's very nice. Um, not that we're under pressure to say that, but no, I do. I'm very keen on the, the Adidas stuff. Smart. And Tony, it's almost like you've almost kind of got like a trickler effect going there. You've got the green tracksuit top, the white t-shirt, and the uh, the ginger beard. <laughs> yeah, I know green's my green's my favourite colour, not just because of Celtic. I think it goes well with the ginger. <laughs> And again, just for the, some people will just be listening to this, but we have to give you some kudos for uh, being the guy who's got the uh, appropriately stacked bookshelf behind you. To be fair, if I tried to do this sitting on the couch or sitting on the bed like I did last time, the dog would be climbing all over me. So I'm sitting on a stool so that she can't get me. Well, if, if she does make an appearance, we hope that she's uh, obviously on brand as well with some sort of Celtic gear. We... Obviously, last week we spoke just ahead of the, the Hamilton game. That was the first game of the season. We kicked off flag day, we won 5-1. It was a, a strange experience. I was there in the stadium. I know you guys were watching it from home. It, you know, the team played well. We got a great result. It, it's just a, it was altogether quite a surreal experience, given the fact there was no supporters there. Uh, yeah, uh, it was. It was... I think we have seen, you know, covered reserve games. So we've seen uh, the, the hoops and Celtic play without crowds, but we've not seen the first team. We've not seen anything like this, and especially not inside Celtic Park. So it is, it's really strange. It's sad. It feels a, it's a strange mix of emotions, a bit sombre because the fans aren't there and the atmosphere isn't there. That's what this amazing stadium was built for. It's what the club's renowned for, having the fans and the atmosphere. So missing them really is a big miss. But thankfully, the, the players are still able to produce that level of performance. They, they know the fans are watching from, from home and uh, you know they've still got the motivation to put on a, a good show for them. Yeah, I spoke to um, Neil Lennon for this week's Celtic View just on that point about the, the fans not being there and We've rightly made a lot about how the players will adapt to the closed off football. It's different, so used to the, the atmosphere and the noise at Celtic Park. And one thing I was saying to Neil Lennon was it's new for them as well as managers. So going into the break, two one up, um, you know, possibly might have done uh, a little bit better for for Hamilton's goal. A little bit of luck, obviously, with the deflection and took it past the goalkeeper. But Neil Lennon was looking for a response from his players. And that normally goes hand in hand with the response from the fans. And, and actually, we don't have that just now. So I think the manager was really pleased with how the players responded, obviously going out and scoring three goals and conceding none in the second half. And certainly, it was an entertaining game over the course. But in particular, that second half, after the manager and his coaches had a chance to speak to the players, it's good to see that they're able to respond, even if um, you know, you're playing in very different conditions. And I should say, it was a wee bit disconcerting at first, Joe, seeing you without your pink hat, but it is good to see, see that <laughs> shiny head. You mentioned I'm, I'm, really getting, I'm really getting held to this hat in the new season, but um, actually, next time, if I didn't realise we are going to do a video today, but I'll be shooting sure to bring it in. <laughs> you mentioned this week's Celtic View. Uh, I've just got a copy here, which I'll hold up for the camera for the, the guys that are watching it on video. The hat-trick hero is the, the cover star, Odson Edward, and... I suppose, Tony, you know, we, we know how important Odson is. He scored 28 goals for his last season and he really led the line. And what was interesting, and in, in, you know, I think in, in Joe's interview with the manager, the manager touches on it, the, the goals, we're so used to seeing spectacular goals from Odson. They were real strikers' goals, they were poachers' goals. They, he was inside the six-yard box, they were tap-ins. Those are the sort of goals you love to see strikers scoring. Yeah, I think it just highlights how much he has to offer, how much there is to his game. You know, he's, he's brilliant at, you know, cuddling it in from outside the box or beating a couple of players and slipping it past the keeper. But like you say, he showed real striker instincts there. I think it just shows how much he's continuing to, to mature. You know, his potential is still so far off, even though he is brilliant at this moment in time. Um, so it was, it was great to, to see that. It gives you a lot of confidence that, you know, if ever he's having quiet moments in games, he, he's got that quality and awareness just to, to pop up and be in the right place at, at the right time. I was really happy with his all-round performance as well. I think he shows great strength as well. 
Hamilton can be quite a physical team. I think Scott Brown said that, that they'll, you know, they'll kind of try and bully them, but they, they sort of rise to that. They can, they're more than capable of handling that. And Edward, as well, he showed that good strength and holding off some of the, the, the challenges. So it's, it's great to see just how much there is to his game and how much he has to offer just that when he drops deep as well. Yeah, Neil, Neil Lennon said that when he came back in, didn't he? That he was more interested in seeing Celtic building on um, the success that they achieved in the last few seasons and playing more attacking football, getting those balls into the box, you know, causing the goalkeeper problems. And you saw some of the balls that James Forrest and Greg Taylor, especially um, last Sunday, were playing right in between the goalkeeper and the, the last defender. Perfect for players like Watson Edward just to have the presence of mind. Doesn't need to, as you say, Tony, we've seen him so often as he taking players on, as he dropping deep, he's allowing for the overlap. But just taking that shot first time, three goals, three first touches. And as you were saying, as the manager said, the real striker's goals. Um, which we don't see that often from him, but to get a hat trick out of it was the perfect way to start the campaign. Well, we talk about okay. Odson Edwards' hat trick, and we're just going to have a wee look back uh, or a wee listen back to the first of those three goals. And it was ultimately a tap in, but it was a, a brilliant team goal started by Scott Bain, finished by Odson Edwards. Showing none of the ill effects of the first challenge, he took another one there from Want. But here's Taylor, Celtic coming forward in numbers. New season, same result. It's Odson Edward, who is off the mark inside 20 minutes. Last season's top scorer does it again. Well, he didn't score in pre-season, Darren, but making absolutely no mistake when it really counts. Absolutely. And this is what we're talking about, Hamilton's so disciplined moving with Celtic's uh, play and, and shutting off gaps, but when you've got a, a player right back, Jeremy Frimpong, that can drive into the pitch and open up the whole of, of Hamilton's organisation, plays wide, a great ball across the box, actually Edward who lays it off, Taylor, we just spoke about the full back system. I suppose Joe, you know, we were talking to the manager on Monday for the view and there was a lot of things that pleased him and I think one of the things that you noticed was he did feel, he did feel, and given the fact it was a first competitive game in five months, maybe the first half, he, he described it as undercooked maybe because we hadn't played that many games pre-season, but certainly in the second half, we kind of stepped up and we kind of posed ourselves on the game and maybe played the kind of football that he wants us to see and I don't really remember Hamilton having much of a chance in the second half, although they'd created a few things in the first half. Yeah, uh, Brian Rice has got Hamilton playing whenever they come to Celtic Park, they normally sit in. We spoke in the podcast last week about the last time Hamilton came and they snatched an equaliser in the 90th minute and luckily Scott Brown popped up with a winner um, a few minutes after that. It, you could kind of see they were trying to do similar, I think, at the weekend. And given that they, with all due respect to their performance, I don't think they really deserved to be their only one goal in it going into half time. And then, yeah, I think that Celtic came back in, in the second and really forced our game. Neil Lennon says, you know, he was allowing for that kind of rustiness in the first game. Said he was, he was understanding with the players at half time. I'd love to have been standing outside the dressing room to see if he was as calm as he was making out. Um, but they really responded, however, to speak to them. And it's great to see, as I say, like, I don't think you can underestimate how difficult that must be for managers to get the players fired up without the the emphasis and without the crowd accentuating that need to get goals and come out. If Celtic could have just returned in the second half, maybe snatched a goal um, and then saw out the game because Hamilton, as you say, weren't really bringing too much, but to keep going and to get those three goals was the final second half. It was really good to see. And obviously, as I said at the start, Tony, I was able to watch the game in the stadium. How was it watching the game from home? It's still the game, you know, and maybe you don't quite get the sense of the fans not there. Or what was that experience like? I think there was a lot of excitement there, you know, more so than there would be going into to any sort of start of the season because it's been so long without the, the competitive football. So I think that sort of um, overshadowed maybe some of the apprehension that you would have or the, the nerves that you would have about there not being any fans. And I think watching from home as well, your eyes are really focused on the pitch. You, you can't really look side to side and see the empty the stands and thankfully... The, the quality of the football was that good that you're completely engrossed in it. You, you're just watching Celtic, you know, almost playing exactly like they were in, in March. It's as if the, the break never happened. They've really just returned in, in great condition and, and the speed of their attack and play, particularly down the flanks with both the, the fullbacks, is, is brilliant to see. So I, I think you're just really drawn into to the game as well. So it wasn't too jarring, not as much as I think maybe we thought it would be coming into this. And interesting as well that the, the bench... 
at the weekend, there was nine, we're now allowed to name nine substitutes, and you're allowed to make five substitutes, although only over three breaks, so you can't have five different substitution breaks, but you can bring five subs on, and I suppose maybe for some of the young guys, we saw Karamoko coming on late in the game, and, and that's this is maybe the season where some of these young guys are going to get a chance in the first team, because we have, the manager's got that option to bring more players on. You definitely yeah, think, I think so. Think oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Please. Uh, sorry it's the Chuckle Brothers again. <laughs> After you. Um, the manager said that, that he wants uh, Karamoko in and around the, the first team this season. You know, it's not just a case of the, the game time, that's obviously crucial, but just being around the, the first team players, seeing how they carry themselves, what they're doing day to day, the sort of time that they're investing in the gym and what else they're doing away from the, the training pitch, I think that'll be really good for him so that this will be a big season for for his development and uh, there's more opportunities there for him to to get on I think it's a good sign seeing him involved from the the first game of the season you know usually some of the academy graduates it's towards the end of the the season maybe when there's a nice comfortable gap and the pressure isn't as high then that you would see them but the fact that we're seeing him come on and and play a part now it's, it's, it's good going forward for him. And obviously this week's Celtic View has been out since August the 5th. And as well as we speak to Christopher Iyer, we speak to Roy Aitken. Next week we mentioned Karim Oko. He's going to be in next week's Celtic View along with Odds and Edward. Another young player, you, Tony, you'd mentioned some of the academy guys getting a chance. Joe, another player that's, that's in the, the view this week, Kerr McEnroy, who I think is, you know, like a lot of young players, maybe unlucky that he was pushing towards the first team squad, certainly training, and then got that injury thankfully he's back he's been involved in pre-season and like the rest of the guys that Tony touched on just be looking to maybe get a chance yeah it was really it was really um, heartening speaking to Kerr because he talks about he got a cruciate ligament injury and was out for eight months and he got injured in a reserve game uh, last year thought the injury was you know it was bad enough to have to retire in that game but had no real sense of of the extent of the injury got a scan and then realized that it was long term and when he speaks about the injury, um, and naturally, you know, he didn't want that injury and he doesn't want any injuries moving forward, but he speaks like um, in the same way about appreciating his time on the pitch in the same way some of the more mature players speak about it. So it was really, it was really nice to see such a young player, um, only 20 years old, talking about his appreciation for the time on the pitch and really pushing to get that first team football. Prior to his injury, he was captain of Tom McIntyre Reserves. He was training with the first team. He'd been away in pre-season. And he did that long spell out. He then came back. Um, his first game was in January, or February rather. His second game was in March. And just as he's pushing, albeit at the tail end of the season, to get back into football, of course, you know, the coronavirus happens in lockdown. So a really strange journey for him. Um, but he seems not, I mean, he's champing at the bit, just, just like any young player looking to, to make an impact. But it feels with him, given his setback and him, you know, kind of coming back onto the scene and being out of things because of, lockdown and such he really wants to push this season ahead I'm sure he will in terms of looking ahead to, to the weekend we're at Rugby Park the plastic pitch it's always always a difficult venue we don't know yet whether the team will be wearing the hoops or whether they might be wearing the uh, the lime green or the, the, the fresh mint uh, green as it's now called I have to say uh, you know as soon as, as I saw that a uh, new away kit that's coming out, I think, on the 18th of August. Uh, I, obviously, it took me back to memories of Love Street 86, but it is an absolute belter. And I know I mentioned at the start that they've, they've redone the Superstore, they've redone the, the Girl Street store as well. It's all Adidas branded. And I think some of the mannequins in the Superstore are, are modelling the, the away kit just now. And I, I just think that is going to fly off the shelves. And, you know, whether it gets its debut on Sunday, uh, you know, I, I'm certainly going to be wearing it in future podcasts, I have to tell you right now. Yeah, we usually do wear our away strip at Rugby Park, don't we? So I'm, I'm hoping that we see it as it's brilliant. Obviously, that came out the, the year before that I was born, so I don't have many memories of the, the original one. But yeah, this is a, a nice nod to it. And I was showing it to my dad the other day, and he kind of he could see the resemblance right away. He's a big fan of it. So I, I think it'll fly off the shelves. Nice, no, a cracker. Um, in terms of the game itself, obviously rugby park because I think mainly because of the surface, it, it can be a real leveler, and it obviously gives the home side an advantage because they're used to playing on, on that surface. Joe, you and I are going to be there on Sunday. I, I take it we're just going to be expecting the usual tough game again because Kilmarnock have are that familiar 
familiarity playing on the artificial pitch. Yeah, um, Alex Dyer, I know this was said quite a few times towards the end of last season, but he has got command at playing uh, like Steve Clark. I know that he, he, he worked under him before, worked, worked alongside him rather, um, which is very organised, very tight. They play that pitch, um, it's quite narrow. I know we speak about the conditions and the manager's very keen not to, to dwell on it too much because we've spoken about it so much. You do need to play the pitch, play the conditions. It'd be interesting to see, I know that the the travelling support at Rugby Park, Celtic's travelling support is normally very vocal. So I do think that Celtic will actually miss their um, their portion of that at Rugby Park. If they can play um, similar to how they did back in January, I would really fancy Celtic. But it will be a very different um, game from last Sunday, I suspect. You'll expect Kamarnik to, to sit deep to play tight. To try and catch Celtic on the break, you'd have to assume Celtic will be playing their kind of familiar press. I think it will be a physical game. And I think because... There's no atmosphere to drown it out, um, a very limited atmosphere to drown it out. I think, I think you'll hear a lot of crunching tackles. Um, I think that Neil Lennon's men will be up for it, but I do think it'll be a very different game from what we've seen so far. And uh, I, I'm not sure who the, the official is on Sunday, Tony, but uh, it's Tom Boyd and I that are on commentary duty for Celtic TV. So I'm sure Tom will be his usual, uh, you know, praise the officials for the, the good work that they do throughout the game. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure the officials will, will be keeping an ear out. They'll see Tom Boyd in the, the stand and I, I reckon they'll be able to hear everything he says. And I suppose, I, in a way, you know, the manager mentioned uh, in the view, Tony, about the fact that it was the first competitive game last weekend. Gave the players a couple of days off and then they're back preparing. Kilmarnock, they obviously lost uh, Easter Road last weekend 2 one So they'll be keen to try and get their season off to win and start. But I suppose you want to build... The manager said every point is precious every season, but particularly this season, you want to kind of build that momentum of win after win in the early stages of the campaign. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's not easy having to do that the second game going away to Rugby Park. It is, is difficult. I was watching the highlights of the Kilmarnock and, and Hibs game and they did look good uh, in spells. So they'll be disappointed that at losing at the first game of the season, they'll be desperate to get a win. You know, they've given Celtic difficult games. They'll be confident from how, how close they've run Celtic in recent seasons. But, um, you know, I think like Joe touched on, the, a, a big part of that is, you know, that home advantage and that, that crowd behind them. Albeit sometimes there's been more Celtic fans than Kilmarnock fans at Rugby Park. But, yeah, I, I think the players will know that, that. They're all quite experienced. They've all been, a lot of them have been to, to Rugby Park numerous times I'll know what to expect as well and I think the confidence coming off that 5-1 win and knowing that the, the European games are now on the horizon there's there's a pressure to, to really keep building momentum and putting in the, the performances as well players still pushing to to get in that first team and get a, a regular place early in the season so I think everything's everything's good in that regard everybody's really highly motivated and I expect that this one might not be as close as they have been in the past I hope you're right. Because it's funny, I, I think, you know, we've had five months without a competitive football and then we just have this week between the games. It's almost, it kind of feels like the camp before the storm. Uh, Joe Tony just touched on the fact we've got European games coming up. The, the draw for a first qualifier is on Sunday, then the, the draw for the next round on Monday. I think the draw for the Betfred Cup is on Monday as well. We've got a game next Wednesday followed by Aberdeen at Celtic Park. And, and you just get the feeling that suddenly... There's just going to be game after game after game after game. Yeah, and of course the schedule's changed. We've normally played European qualifiers before now. We're going to get them later in the month. The semi-final of last year's Scottish Cups at the end of October and November. Successful there. You've got a final five days before Christmas. So the players always speak about playing game to game. They always speak about the congested schedule, particularly on this side of the year. It's a new challenge this year, and I was speaking to the manager about that in the Celtic View um, this week as well, saying, that, again, we, our natural focus is on the players because they're the guys out in the pitch, but there's so much um, of a new challenge posed for the coaches and the manager because they need to set the timetables and the programmes when they're playing all these games, new fixture schedules and such. The players are well-versed in how busy it is in Scotland, particularly on this side of the year, and... Again, sometimes it can frustrate us in the media when we are, we're looking for that hook in an article, but the players are so adamant game to game. I think this season, given that there will be um, external pressure, uh, given how important the season it is in Scottish football, particularly for Celtic, that game to game mantra, whether it's Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday, Sunday, Thursday, wherever we're playing in Europe, will be extra important this year. And I'm sure the players will be diligent, 
all getting carried away, not thinking too far ahead and just focusing on, on that next fixture. And obviously, we've done it in the past in the podcast, I'm going to put you on the spot in terms of Sunday's game. Joe, I'll start with you. How do you see the game going and a score prediction? I said 2-0, didn't I, on the game on Sunday, so I was well off with that. Yeah, I'm going to go 2-0 again, though. I'm going to say conservative first half. I do think that Kilmarnock will try and pick Celtic off, try and catch them in the counter-attack. Um, but I think that over the course, Scott Brown is forever talking about the fitness levels of the squad. And I think we're already seeing that, even though we're only one competitive game in. I think 2-0 and two goals in the second half. Not willing to pick a scorer, but happy with that scoreline. The thing is, the law of averages suggests if you just predict 2-0 every week, you're going that's to That's it. Yeah, I think, I think that's it. I'm just hedging my bets. <laughs> Tony, you already hinted the fact that you think it might be a wee bit more comfortable than previous visits? Yeah, I hope so. I think, I think I'd go for 3-0 this time. And it, it'll be a bit different, you know, with that surface. is like when I'm thinking back to that opening goal, um, you know, it started with, with Bain and Fringpong, you know, running inside with that pace. The, the, the pitch at Rugby Park doesn't really allow for that to the same extent. So maybe set pieces, corners, might expect Julian or something to, to get header. Um, maybe having to play the long ball a bit more, but Odds on showing great control and bringing it down and holding off challenges. So it doesn't really worry me too much. I think this team have shown that they can score goals in so many different ways. Um, so I'm going to go 3 0. And I'm going to just plump for 3 1. So hopefully, as long as the Celtic win, it doesn't really matter what the score line is. Yeah, and it'll be a bonus if they were that lovely away strip as well. So. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, thanks guys for joining us on the Celtic View podcast. Remember, this week's Celtic View is out and you can also order it online or you can download the digital version. We're already working on next week's view where we'll have Odson Edward, Karamoko, the interview with Peter Latchford as well and, and lots of other stuff. And uh, as I say, thanks for joining us. We're going to finish with a goal from Rugby Park actually. And the goal is from a couple of seasons ago. It's the goal that is, is billed as the, the night Scott Brown won the league. It was a, a last gas one and I think everybody who was there or everybody who watched it on Celtic TV will remember those uh, momentous scenes when the, the captain, who ended up getting sent off as a result of his celebrations, <laughs> uh, scored what proved to be the winner at Rugby Park. Celtic come again. Well, we have seen late drama in the past. We spoke about Tom Rogic, his wonder goal. But won it 1 0. The ball's not forward. Looking for Weir. Takes a first touch. Is exquisite. Bayev tries to flick it well. It was such a tight angle. And it's a corner kick. Well, the official over on the far side signals for the corner. Could this be the moment? Fingers crossed. I actually thought that was a bye kick in all honesty, Paul. But what a touch from Timo Weir as he's taken the long ball down. It was tight for Bayo and he's managed to get himself in a position where he's won his team a corner. As you say, Paul, here we go. It could be last minute drama. Callum McGregor with the delivery in the last 60 seconds files it across the far side looking for Boyate heads it back it's a chance for Brown he scored at the net Scott Brown has scored what a magnificent strike it took a deflection the Bruni again and Celtic into injury time and they're leading by a goal to nil fantastic Paul I think it was over 700 games since Scott Brown had scored when he scored the other week against the Johnson and He's now scored again, which is surely the match winner. 